Hello, I'm Derek Walker, the pastor of the Oxford Bible Church. We're in a series called The Divine Institutions and the Spirit of Lawlessness. And uh, we've seen that God governs this world uh, as well as his, his absolute authority that he has, but he governs this world to a great degree through the divine institutions. And these are areas of delegated authority where he imparts his authority to, different, to each one of us in different ways. And his, these areas of authority are called the divine institutions. And for us to submit to God, we need to recognize those authorities and submit to those and honor those authorities if it's to go well with us. And we saw that on the other hand, Satan uh, and the very nature of sin is lawlessness. This word lawlessness doesn't just mean transgression or disobedience to authority. Lawlessness means the very rejection of divine authority, uh, uh, with, to be without law, to reject God's law. And the spirit of lawlessness in the world that the Bible predicts would increase as we go into the end times involves a wholesale rejection of God's authority and God's law, where man says, no, I throw off all authority and I will be who I want to be. I will be my own God. I will define myself. And, and, and that is the spirit of the world. And we, we need to understand the difference between true authority and the spirit of, of lawlessness. Uh, in the defined institutions we saw in Romans 13, the Bible says, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. And that's in every sphere. We saw the different authorities that God placed in man. So far we've seen human uh, free will, that God gives each man authority over his own life, each person. And then in the workplace, God ordained work, and so there's authority in the workplace. Then the, there's marriage, and there's authority within marriage. And then family, there's authority within family, parents to children. And all these areas of authority were introduced even before the fall. They are, as it were, the ways in which God uh, structured the human race and our social life. And so um, they, they are vital that we, we honor those authorities. And so it says in Romans, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. So when you submit to authority, you're actually submitting to God. And the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority, resists the ordinance of God, resists God. And those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. It won't go well for them. Now, this isn't saying that authorities have to be perfect, because the authorities in the time that Paul wrote were, were by no means perfect. But yet, we have to see, pass the person to see the authority that they carry. Now, authority, we've seen, can be abusive. It can overstep its, its boundaries, and we're not required to, to obey it when it oversteps its boundaries. We must ultimately submit to God, who is the higher authority. But where the authority is, um, you know, a valid authority, we are to give honor and submission to that authority. I want to give an illustration of the spirit of lawlessness from a time when the authority failed. Uh, in the days of Noah, after the flood, uh, Noah was the authority over his family and the three sons. And uh, through his authority, he had saved all their lives th through the flood. But um, nevertheless, we see in the story in Genesis 9 that uh, w how the spirit of lawlessness works. Uh, the spirit of lawlessness will often use a cloak of righteousness to discredit and destroy the authority when it gets the chance. It's looking for an opportunity. It's looking for when the authority messes up or seems to be messing up, and then it will use that in a, in, under a cloak of righteousness to actually attack, undermine, and try to destroy that authority. And that is when the often the spirit of lawlessness in a person, the rebellion in a person's heart, is manifested when the authority fails. We see that with Noah and Ham and Canaan. 
in Genesis 9. It says, Noah began to be a farmer. He planted a vineyard and he drank of the wine and he was drunk and he became uncovered in his tent. And he probably wasn't a pretty sight. I mean, he was over 600 years old at this point. He's, he's naked in his tent. He's drunk. And, uh, and so here is a case where Noah, yes, he sinned, but it was not, it was a sin of foolishness more than anything. And uh, there's no particular condemnation for his sin in, in this chapter because the chapter is pointing out a far greater sin, which was the sin of rebellious, rebellion in, in, with Ham. And so notice how the different brothers respond to Noah's sin when the authority sins. Ham, the father of Canaan, uh, and we'll see the real culprit here is, is Canaan, but Ham ha plays a role too. He saw the nakedness of his father and he told his two brothers outside. Now, the purpose of him telling them is to expose the authority, to mock the authority. Because you see, uh, and you've got to realize that all these three sons were believers. I mean, they were, they were saved in the flood. They, they were on the ark. They were believers. But even so, uh, Ham allowed, as a believer even, some lawlessness in his heart. Inwardly, he resented his father's authority, that the father called the, main, that called the shots. And so he used Noah's failure to expose his sin, to kind of ridicule it thinking that his two brothers would join in the mockery and Noah would not no longer have the same status that he had before. And uh, it's interesting that these two sons did not have the same spirit. Um, it says that uh, the Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it on both their shoulders and went backward and covered the nakedness of their fathers and their faces were turned away and they did not see their father's nakedness. So they were honouring Noah's authority, even though they knew he messed up. They, they had a spirit of honour and, and, and that showed that they had the right relationship to his authority uh, despite his sin. And it's interesting, it says that when Noah woke up from his wine, the Spirit of God came on him. So yes, he messed up, but, but God was still with him, and God was supporting his authority. And God actually then uh, released power through Noah's authority, because Noah prophesied. And he gave a prophecy actually against Canaan, so, which is interesting, not against Ham, but against Canaan. Uh, Canaan was Ham's son. Now, how come? Surely this was Ham's sin. Well, it would seem, putting the clues together, that Ham was actually repentant. I think when his brothers moved in a spirit of honour, then Ham suddenly, his sin was exposed to him, and Ham was repentant. He was shamed by the example of his brothers. And because he was repentant, he, he did not come under that curse. But sadly, because Ham had allowed that rebellion in his heart, it had infected one of his sons, Canaan. And this Canaan did not repent. In fact, from Canaan came the Canaanites. And the Canaanites were the main source of evil in the ancient world. So much so that God had to judge them. Of course, we know about Sodom and Gomorrah. But also, when their, their, their sin came to its fullness, um, the invasion of the Promised Land by Israel was actually... Uh, they were an instrument of judgment because their sin had got so terrible. They sacrificed their children. They had all kinds of terrible things. And so because Canaan did not repent, uh, now Noah actually sees in the spirit and then he announces this judgment against Canaan. He says, Cursed be Canaan, the servant of servants shall he be to his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and may Canaan be a servant. May God enlarge Japheth, and may he dwell in the tents of Shem. May Canaan be his servant. And so those who are lawless, again, come under judgment. But this is a warning, even to believers. If you allow that lawlessness in your heart, that bad attitude in your heart, there's a great danger that you, even if you then repent, that you will have passed it on to your children. Uh, and so that's how lawlessness often works. It waits for the opportunity for the authority to sin. And, and yes, it's right then to hold the authority accountable. Uh, it needs to be uh, dealt with. 
But then the spirit of lawlessness comes along and says, right, this is the basis to mock the authority, to overthrow the authority, to burn down the whole authority structure. And, and that's essentially the agenda you know, of cultural Marxists. They want to burn down society, uh, t which is built on biblical Judeo-Christian foundations. Um, and it will use the cover of righteous causes to do it. But the real agenda goes beyond that cause to destroy the foundations of society. And they think to replace it with their own utopian world. But actually, whenever this has happened in the past, because they don't factor in, the real problem is not the authorities, it's sin in the human heart. And uh, by removing the authority, all you do is re you remove on the restraint on sin and all hell breaks loose. And in the end, what you need is a totalitarian, totalitarian power to take over and control everything. And in the end, you end up, it always works the same way, you end up with this atheist, communistic state that totally is the worst places to live on the earth because all human freedom is, is lost. And it all comes from a rejection of God and his authority. Well, we're now going to look at the next two divine authorities and they came in after the fall because the fall uh, meant evil is now released in the earth. And so God had to bring in restraints on evil. And that's the purpose of the next two divine institutions uh, to create a, a sense of order and peace in the world so that the gospel of salvation might go forth. You know, after the fall happened, without these divine institutions in place, what happened is the violence spread throughout the earth. Um, we read about it in Genesis 6. It says, The Lord saw that wickedness of man was great in the earth. Every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. The, the earth was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So God looked on the earth, and indeed it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. So when sin broke out, there was no authorities in the land, um, like government, uh, and so everyone did what they wanted to do, and soon enough, terrible evil spread throughout the whole earth until there was only one righteous authority left which was Noah and his family there's only one godly family left that's how much evil spread the whole earth was corrupted with evil and lawlessness and violence and so this shows the need for the divine institutions that God brought in after the flood and so in, after the flood through the Noah's, the covenant that God made with Noah, God instituted the next divine institution, which is human government, law and order, uh, justice. In fact, that's the main purpose of government, actually. Well, there are two main purposes of government, which are the next two divine institutions. The first one is law and order, the impl bringing in justice, dealing with criminal behavior. And uh, God gave man, through this covenant, the responsibility to exercise authority, to restrain evil in society, to exercise judgment on evil. See, before that, for instance, when Cain killed Abel, there was no authority in place to deal with Cain. He was, he was allowed to be free, although God kind of banished him. Um, but now capital punishment was introduced as the ultimate symbol of the authority of the state, the, the power to punish by the sword, as it were. And, um, and so all the le by giving them the top punishment, that meant that for lesser crimes, the, the capital punishment was for premeditated murder, but for lesser crimes there would be lesser punishments. But God here was actually granting human beings in the form of the state, the government, the authority to investigate and to punish crime. And um, we see this in Genesis 9, verse 5. He says, Surely for your lifeblood I will demand a reckoning. From the hand of every beast and from the hand of man I will require it. From the hand of every man's brother I will require the life of man. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. 
for in the image of God he made man. And what he is saying is if somebody premeditates and kills and murders a man, then he should suffer the loss of his life as a result. So this is also giving the principle of justice, a life for a life. Or in other words, an eye for an eye. So if it's a lesser crime, the punishment should fit the crime. But God's putting it in the hands of human government to deal with these kind of crimes. And that is the primary purpose of, of government, to institute law and order, to restrain evil, so that evil does not just spread. There are, it is rendered accountable. And so we see this in Romans 13, of course. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God. And those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. They're there to restrain the evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you'll have praise from the same. For he is God's minister to you for good. The authority is there for, the good, for our good, to have peace, so that we can have an atmosphere of order. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. So he, is, he has the right to punish criminal activity, even up to cap capital punishment. For he is God's minister. He's operating under divine authority. He's an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore, you must be subject, not only because of wrath, not only because, you know, of the consequences of, being, uh, of committing a crime, but also for conscience sake, because you should honor authority because his authority comes from God. Because of this, sorry about this, the next line, you must also pay your taxes. For they are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. Render therefore to all their due taxes, to whom taxes are due, customs, to whom customs are due, fear, to whom fear, honour, to whom honour. And so it's very clear that he says submit to, the. this is the divine institution of human government. It may be unbelievers who are in authority, in the police, the judges and so on, but yet God, God has given them authority, and we must honour that. Peter says the same, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. In other words, when you're submitting to them, you're submitting to the Lord. If you disrespect them, you're disrespecting the Lord. Whether to the king as supreme, he says, or governors, uh, as to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. So, True authorities should reward those who do good, but also punish the evil. For this is the will of God, but by doing good you may put to silence the, the ignorance of foolish men. As free, yet not using liberty as a cloak for vice, but as bondservants of God. You're submitted to God, and that's why you submit to the authorities. It says, honour all people. That's the first divine institution. Every person has free will. Honour them as honour the authority they have over their own life. Love the brotherhood. That's the seventh divine institution. That's the church. Give a special honour to the brothers and sisters in Christ. Fear God. He's the ultimate source of all authority. Honour the king, he says. And that's the divine authority institution number five, the, the government. And so this is very important in your submission to God. Now, of course, if authorities tell you to do something, that contradicts the word of God, you must obey the higher authority, which is God. Uh, you know, Peter says, when they are told to stop preaching in the name of Jesus, he says, we ought to obey God rather than men. In other words, he's saying, you're exceeding your, the bounds of your authority uh, by telling us to do this wrong thing, so we won't obey you. But they still submitted to them as authorities, and they, they took the punishment of those authorities and they committed themselves to God. So they still honoured the authorities, but they didn't necessarily obey the authorities if they were telling them to do something wrong. And so we, um, we, we need to understand the, that there is authorities in the land. The spirit of lawlessness uh, seeks to destroy those authorities. But those authorities, whether they're the police, the judges, whatever, though they may fail, fail sometimes and sin sometimes, they need to be held to account. 
but lawlessness tries to actually destroy those authorities, and that is a, a worse evil. The sixth divine institution is the nation-state, or, or nationalism. And uh, this is also necessary to bring stability and restrain the spread of evil. And um, in Genesis 10 and 11 is where this is instituted, particularly Deuteronomy 32.8 talks about God dividing the world into different nations uh, and setting the boundaries of the peoples. Um, Acts 17.26 also talk of, talking about God establish the boundaries of the different nations and this actually happened at the tower of babel um, because satan's plan although there was human government was instituted the, satan's tried to use that because he tried to bring in a one world government at the tower of babel uh, it says in genesis 11 that the whole world had one language and one speech and as they journeyed from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. Now remember, God told man, uh, Noah to, to spread out and fill the earth. But man had a different, and that required them to split into different nations. But actually, man had a different idea. Let's set up a one world government. Sounds good. All man united under one leader. And they said, come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. And, um, and it says, let's build for ourselves a city and a tower whose top is to the heavens, Babylon. And uh, this become the symbol now for the one world government. And it says, let's make a name for ourselves, lest be, we be scattered over the face of the whole earth. This is a rebellion against God who wanted them to scatter over the earth into different nations. But they now want to make themselves powerful. And as a result, God could not let this stand because it, it was a rebellion. God came down to see the city and the tower and he said, look, the, the people are one. They all have one language. Uh, and if this is what they begin to do, now nothing they propose to do will be withheld from them. And so God announces his judgment. Let us go down there and confuse their language that they do not understand each other's speech. And the Lord therefore scattered them abroad from there over the face of the whole earth and they ceased. Building the city, its name is called Babel because God's confused the language of them. And so what God was actually doing here, this was Satan's attempt to bring mankind under one ruler, Nimrod, who is a picture of the Antichrist. Because if he can get a totalitarian one world government under one man, uh, he can force all all the men subjugate all men and cut them off from god um and and require their worship uh, of that one religion and that one man and then uh renounce all the knowledge of god and that way satan will will bring in his total control over humanity and so although it might be a good idea you might think for there to be a one world government uh, it's, it cannot be put into the hands of sinful man. It never works because man is a sinner and power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. And so an evil man taking over would then mean evil takes over the whole world. And so God restrains evil by dividing the world into different nations. And so if evil takes over one nation, a dictator takes over one nation, it's limited to that nation. So it's like a break is put on, um, on what's going on. Now one day God will have a one world government, uh, but it will be under Jesus Christ who is sinless and therefore worthy to rule over the whole earth. But now what is happening is Satan wants to destroy the divine institution of the nation state. He wants to destroy nationalism. He wants to make nationalism into a dirty word because he wants to destroy the nation state. He wants to destroy borders to create a one world government. And, and we see in the tribulation, that's what he'll do. And for three and a half years under the Antichrist, there will be this one world government and it will be the worst, the most evil and the worst time ever because all free freedom will be crushed. Everyone will be forced on pain of death to take the mark of the beast and everyone will have to reject God. Antichrist says there 
He re totally rejects God and his law. And he forces men, as it were, to, to worship him. And it's totalitarian government, total lawlessness. And that um, will happen, but God will then judge it. Like he judged the Tower of Babel in the first place, he will judge the second Tower of Babel, and then he'll set his kingdom up over the whole earth. But God ordained the nation-state and as, as, a, as a break on the spread of evil over the world, because if evil breaks out in one place, it's restrained to that one state. And that's why the main function of the state is, first of all, law and order, and secondly, defense. You know, to, in other words, a state has to defend itself, arm itself. That is the function of the state, and because by a strong state then is a restraint on the spread of evil through an evil, aggressive state. And so those are the next two divine institutions. And next time we are going to complete this series by looking at the final divine institution, which is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, which carries his spiritual authority in the earth. Praise God. It's so important to know the gospel and how to share the gospel. And that's why I've written an evangelism training course that you can actually use and work through yourself. It comes with a CD that gives you an example presentation of the gospel. And uh, it comes with a good news booklet as well. And, and you can do it in, in, in a group or individually to share the gospel. And I've also want to present this CD series with eight CDs on the Lordship of Christ. It's so important that we don't avoid this subject that Jesus is Lord as well as Savior and this will present again the gospel to you, the true gospel that doesn't compromise and water as so often happens today. Jesus is Lord. Thank you for watching. Join with us at Oxford Bible Church every Sunday at 11 a.m. Greenwich Mean Time for our live stream service or join us at Cheney School Headington, Oxford, OX3 7QH. You can watch more of our teachings on our Roku channel and Derek Walker's YouTube channel. All Derek Walker's books are available in printed and Kindle versions in all Amazons worldwide or online with other great products, where you can also support our programs at www.oxfordbiblechurch.co.uk or by calling 01865 515 086